Our final speaker for today is uh, Nicola Martin. And uh, Nicola will give a talk on improving the performance of Python code for processing Earth observation data using GPUs. OK, okay thank you. Um, so uh, I'm Nicola Martin. I work at the Plymouth Marine Laboratory. And today I'm going to be talking about a project I was uh, recently working on, looking at um, improving the performance of some satellite data processing code uh, using GPUs. I did this piece of work with uh, my colleague Dan Cluley, based at PML, and also in collaboration with um, Neil McCarroll, who's based at the University of Reading, and Rob Parker and Christina Ruiz Vienna, based at the University of Leicester. So uh, to begin, I just wanted to give a bit of background about the project. So uh, this was led by the National Center for Earth Observation, or NCEO, and it was funded by the Natural Environment Research Council, or NERC, which is part of UK research and innovation. And uh, the aim of the project was basically to see whether we could speed up some NCEO code using GPUs. Um, it was a relatively short project, um, so we weren't really uh, trying to uh, create the perfect piece of code or um, get really precise results in terms of energy usage but we were really trying to get a feel for what was possible um, in terms of uh, timings and also potentially saving energy so given the timescales of the project we decided python would be a good language to work with uh, not only is that the language I'm most familiar with, but it also would enable us to use some of the open source GPU libraries that are available for Python. So we were looking for some self-contained pieces of code uh, written in Python that needed speeding up and that I'd be able to get to grips with quite quickly in order to port those to GPU. So our initial challenge in the project was actually finding examples to work with. So uh, people weren't really sure to start with whether their code would be suitable for running on GPUs or whether there'd be a lot of work involved. But um, thankfully, Neil had a couple of um, examples that he thought would benefit from some speeding up, and he put those forward for the project. And what we found was that once we had some examples to show people, more examples started coming forward. Uh, so I had access to GPUs uh, via the Maggio system, which is hosted at PML. Um, and that's the NEODAS system, um, where NEODAS is the NERC Earth Observation Data Acquisition and Analysis Service. And that's hosted at PML, overseen by NCEO and funded by NERC. And as part of their AI service, they uh, provide access to a large GPU cluster called Maggio, where Maggio stands for Massive GPU Cluster for Earth Observation. Um, and that's based around 40 NVIDIA uh, GPUs. And we use uh, Jupyter Hub to provide access to Maggio um, via a browser through the Maggio Hub instance. And I use Maggio Hub for all of the examples in the project to enable me to quickly develop solutions for the problems and then share those with the NCEO scientists. So um, I mentioned there were a number of GPU tools available for Python. So I just wanted to um, go through some of the tools that we looked at during the project. So first up, we have Number, which is an open source just-in-time compiler, and it's designed to make Python code run fast. And it works best for code that uses NumPy arrays and functions, and code that uses loops. Um, for anybody who doesn't use Python, uh, NumPy um, is kind of the go-to um, library for anything data-related. It has multi-dimensional array and routines for running fast operations on, on arrays. And uh, Python also has a useful feature called decorators, which allows you to change the functionality of existing functions in Python. And when you use number, you add a decorator to your functions to tell number to uh, compile your code to machine code. And it can be used for both CPUs and GPUs. And for GPUs, it compiles a subset of Python code to uh, CUDA kernels and device functions. And you can also use, um, and also automatically transfers your NumPy arrays to and from the GPU. So next we have CuPy, um, so that can be used as a drop-in replacement for NumPy and SciPy, which is another uh, Python library. Um, and CuPy has um, an ND array, just like NumPy, and also the associated routines with the same API as uh, NumPy and SciPy. So in theory, you can uh, port your code to run on GPU with CuPy by just changing a single line of code. Um, and you can also create your own custom CUDA kernels using CuPy. 
Um, another set of tools that we uh, wanted to look at in the project was the RAPID uh, suite of open source libraries. The RAPID project is uh, supported by NVIDIA and it relies on several open source libraries like Number. And it's designed to have a similar look and feel for data scientists working um, in Python. So for example, the QDF data frame library is almost a drop-in replacement for the, the Pandas data analysis library. And uh, a lot of uh, Python libraries already have GPU support. And, uh, the, and uh, the RAPIDS team work with a lot of these uh, projects to help them all to run smoothly together. And one such project is um, the XGBoost library, which is one that we looked at during the project. So quickly, uh, the XGBoost uh, library, this is a gradient boosted decision trees machine, machine learning package um, used for regression, classification and ranking problems. And it's written in C++ and NVIDIA CUDA with wrappers for uh, popular languages like Python, R, uh, Java and other popular languages. And to speed up your training uh, with XGBoost, you just need to change one of the parameters which is the tree method, um, and you just change that to GPU hist and you'll run on GPU. Uh, so we'll now take a look at the actual examples that um, I looked at in the project. So the first of Neil's examples um, was a piece of code extracted from a Landsat 8 processing chain, and the code was designed to reproject Landsat 8 data to lat long coordinates. And this was done in two steps. The first step was pure Python. Uh, the second step relied on a library that used uh, C. And uh, the code uh, used NumPy arrays to represent the data. And it looped over all of the pixels in an array, which took quite a long time. Uh, so for the example code that I was given, it took about 12 minutes to run the reprojection. So the approach I took for this example was to use number since it had, um, it was using NumPy arrays and it had loads of loops in the code. So for the first step, um, I just pulled out some of the code into separate functions and used the number vectorized decorator to allow things to run in parallel. And this um, immediately brought this, the timings down to about three minutes from the initial 12. Um, it actually ran marginally faster using number on the CPU than the GPU. And this was because of the time taken between the steps, copying data to and from the GPU. However, when both steps get run on the GPU, there's no longer that need to copy the data between the steps. And so this uh, reduced the overhead and sped things up. So for the second step, it was a little bit more work to um, get it to run on the GPU. And that's because number didn't really know what to do with the C code in the, in the, um, the second step. And so I, was, I had to find a pure Python alternative. Thankfully, with a little bit of Googling, I managed to find a function that did exactly the same thing. And so I was then able to apply the, um, the number decorators to that code and um, run it in a similar way to step one. So running uh, both of the steps on the GPU, we got some fantastic results. And it actually ran in one second. So 700 times faster than the initial code running on the CPU. And the nice thing about number is you, it also speeds things up on the CPU. So we managed to get that down to 20 seconds as well. So Neil took the number-based improvements, added that back to the, the larger code base so that scientists could quickly start to benefit from these speed ups. And he's also been um, adding similar uh, changes to other bottlenecks in the code and seeing improvements there as well. So we circulated the results of this example to the NCO scientists, and we found that there was a lot more interest then and examples started to come forward. So um, in the meantime, we decided to see what we could do with Neil's second example, and that was a Python implementation of self-organizing maps. And the example code um, used some sea level anomaly data, which was averaged over a month of year in that long um, grid cell. And the idea was to use um, a self-organizing map to try and identify similar patterns of seasonal variation in sea level anomaly. And the code used lots of NumPy routines. And um, the basic um, algorithm being used, it's uh, summarized on this Wikipedia link. But um, the general idea is that you would uh, loop over all of the inputs. And there are uh, about 200,000 inputs in the example data. 
And then for every input, you then loop over all of the nodes in a map, um, uh, calculating distances. And the node with the smallest distance would then become the best matching unit, or BMU. And all nodes in the neighborhood of that um, BMU would then have their weights updated. So uh, this code slows down according to the square of the map size when you run it on the CPU. And so for large maps, that can start to become impractical. For the um, example, we use default settings with a map size of eight by eight and 10 iterations, and that took about two minutes to run. So when I first looked at this code, I thought um, it would be a perfect fit for GPUs because there were just so many loops in there. But I, on closer inspection, I realized that a lot of it had to run in series because the weights were being calculated after each of the inputs. For the, um, the BMU calculations, that could be run in parallel, um, and that's actually the part that slows down according to map size. So that it did look like there was some potential for um, using GPUs to speed things up um, when map sizes got larger. So to approach this, I used um, QPy since there were a lot of NumPy routines in the code. But uh, instead of speeding things up, it actually slowed things down considerably and took half an hour to run by just using it as a drop-in. So it's maybe not too surprising that we didn't get uh, a speed up for this example. The map size was pretty small, so there wasn't really much opportunity for parallelizing things here. But I, I took a look at different ways of uh, speeding things up for this um, algorithm, um, including looking at uh, QPy's reduction kernel class, which did help a little bit because it managed to bunch together all of the steps in the distance calculation and to run as a single kernel, and that reduced the overhead a little bit. But then went on to look at different map sizes to see when GPUs may become useful for this problem. And uh, the results for this um, example weren't quite as um, successful as the first one. So um, on the left, we have this uh, graph which shows the time taken to com uh, compute the BMU for different map sizes. And um, we compare here the, um, the results using NumPy, compare those to using QPy. And we see that for small map sizes, QPy is much slower, but the timings are uh, very consistent for growing map sizes. And on this graph, it looks like um, for map sizes of about 50 or more, it may start to become better using QPy. But this is just for the BMU calculation, it doesn't tell the, the whole story. So the, the table on the right uh, shows the time taken for a single iteration, which takes into account all the, the extra copying of data and things like that. And here we see that um, even for map sizes of 100, uh, QPy is still much lower than using NumPy. And so uh, for um, you really need map sizes of 200 or more to start to see the benefit. We did see some uh, improvement uh, by using numbers uh, JIT decorator on the CPU. So there was some potential to speed things up for smaller map sizes. But in general, this algorithm wasn't a great fit for GPU. There were some uh, publications looking at batch-based approaches to self-organizing maps, and that would potentially be a better fit. So not wanting to give up just yet, uh, Neil went away. He rewrote the code using a batch-based algorithm using NumPy. And um, in this code, uh, the, the inputs were batched together, and then um, the weights got updated after each batch. And um, the example code uh, used defaults here, of, uh, map size of 16 by 16 with 10 iterations, and that was already faster than the original code, now running in 40 seconds. So I took the same approach as before. I used QPy as a drop-in replacement. I used the reduction kernel. I did have to make a few more changes in this case uh, because some of the methods that were available in NumPy uh, weren't available for QPy. But it's worth noting that uh, QPy and its underlying libraries are constantly being updated. So if uh, these methods aren't available yet, it's likely that they will be added. So using the same approach as before, we now got some great results. And um, the code ran in less than 200 milliseconds. So we saw an 1800 times speed up from the original uh, SOM script. So this example showed that sometimes you do have to rewrite your code to get it to work well on GPUs, but for this case, it was definitely worth the effort. And if people are interested in finding out more about self-organizing maps, you can check out Neil's uh, repository 
Um, I'll add this link to the end of the talk as well. And um, you'll also find there the, um, the GPU speed ups as well. So uh, this takes us on to our final example. So uh, this was based on a notebook uh, provided by Rob and Christina. And um, it was looking at loading a big data frame and training a model using the XGB regressor from XGBoost package. And uh, it used 21 years of data, one year for validation and the rest for training. And it used the exact tree method, uh, which is the most uh, accurate of the methods. But it took six and a half hours to run. And uh, that meant that any sort of cross-validation for uh, hyperparameter tuning could take days or even weeks to run on a single processor. So the key to speeding this problem up was to change the tree method. Uh, so the exact method is known to be quite slow. Typically, approximations are used, and the fastest of these being the hist method, and it's GPU implementation, GPU hist. And according to the documentation, most of the time, these approximations are just as accurate as using the exact method. So I took the notebook, kept all the other hyperparameters the same, just changed the tree method, and then looked at the timings using the exact method, the uh, hist method and the GPU hist method, and now got uh, some, some more great results. Uh, so the approximations gave equivalent results as the exact method, but they were much faster. So for this CPU, um, the hist method took 45 minutes to run, and using GPU hist, it just took 12 minutes. So we saw um, a speed up of about 30 times uh, from the original six and a half hours. So now cross-validation for hyperparameter tuning is more practical, and we've shown that um, there is potential to speed up the machine learning work um, being carried out at the University of Leicester considerably just by changing one simple thing in the code to let it run on GPUs. So we're really pleased with the, the results in terms of timings on all three examples. So we then went to have an idea of if we could also save energy in these examples. Uh, so we approximated the electricity usage by looking at the uh, run times and the uh, CPU power usage and comparing those to the new run times and the CPU plus GPU power usage. We ignored all other components um, in the system and data center cooling. We also assumed that both the CPU and GPU were drawing maximum power throughout. But the, um, the approximations are summarized in this table along with the percentage reduction based on these figures. And according to these, um, these approximations, it suggests that you could save a massive amount of electricity by using GPUs. So for this some example, it suggested a 99.8% reduction. So yes, it, it, they were based on very rough approximations, but the results were very promising. So it'd be interesting to see how much energy could be saved using more precise figures. So one thing that came out of the project was um, the idea of using training materials for um, researchers in using these tools, uh, particularly um, Number and Kupai, where some of the code changes are more involved. So I created uh, a, a notebook, Getting Started with Number and Kupai, which was based on the lessons learned in the, um, from the, the NCO code examples and contained typical sorts of problems that uh, observation researchers may uh, come across and need these tools for. So if anybody's interested in looking at this notebook, you can find it at the NeoDAS repository. Again, I'll add this uh, link to the end of the talk. So before I wrap things up, um, I just wanted to sort of summarize the lessons that we learned by doing this project. So uh, we found that GPUs work best for uh, repetitive and highly parallel tasks. Um, and we found that all, in all of the examples, when we tried to make changes to get things to run on the GPU, we found improved performance on the CPU as well. And we found copying data to and from the GPU can have a big impact on timings. We found there were lots of uh, useful tools available. Some of these could be very quick fixes. Sometimes a little bit more work was involved, um, and uh, including when you're using external libraries. Um, if they don't have GPU support, sometimes you have to look for pure Python alternatives. But we found that by sharing successful examples, we were able to generate interest in using GPUs. So to summarize the project, we looked at different tools for running code on GPUs, and um, we were looking at the best code suited for running uh, for GPU acceleration. We took three examples from NCO scientists, imported those to run on the NeoDAS Magio system, 
and we made comparisons between running on the CPU and GPU, and finding accelerations are between 30 times and 1800 times, with an estimated 93.9% .9 and 99.8% reduction in electricity usage. And we highlighted the value of expertise in GPUs and coding for air observation research. So as promised, here are uh, some of the links, the resources I mentioned in the talk, and um, thank you all for your attention. Okay, so we have already some questions here. So, uh, do you look at the utilization of the GPU in these uh, examples? Uh, if so, are the GPUs being fully utilized or is there spare capacity for further performance improvement? Uh, so, it being a relatively short project, um, it wasn't something that I looked into properly. Um, I would imagine there was a lot of spare capacity and definitely um, potential for further improvement. Um, so hopefully in the future, um, doing this sort of project, we could spend a bit more time looking in more detail on, on what's actually being used. So another question. Do you have uh, enough experience to advise uh, Earth observation researchers if their problem is li likely to run faster on GPUs? Uh, so that was one of the main aims in the project, was to try and get a feel for uh, the types of problems that could run faster. I think. Um, I've got some more experience now in, in kind of identifying bits of code that look like they have potential and some that definitely wouldn't run, um, be well suited. Um, and hopefully with the, uh, the notebook, that would also help um, people to identify their own code that looks similar to these types of problems um, and give them an idea of whether theirs would be suitable. There's definitely probably... Uh, you know, loads of other examples that we didn't get a chance to look at that would be a good fit as well. So there's a question about the performance between CPU and GPU. So you got a 35x improvement for the CPU code uh, versus 700x for the GPU. Was the CPU code running in parallel as well or just on a single core? Uh, so for the CPU, it was just single core. So there's definitely potential to run things faster on the CPU as well. Um, yeah, potential in, in all of the code for improvements, but um, it was quite exciting to see just how much faster um, you could get things running on the GPU. Uh, would you recommend the GPU first approach to writing code in this domain or start with uh, CPU and uh, optimize it later? Uh, so, um, one thing that we did find, as I mentioned, is when we did start to um, try and move things to the GPU, we found that there were improvements on the CPU. So writing the code in such a way that it would work well on the GPU um, initially, I think would probably give you some good benefits um, straight away. And then just being able to easily port the GPU by maybe tweaking um, some of the settings and not having to rewrite everything to get it to run on GPU, I think is a good approach with a lot of things moving towards using GPUs more. Another question is about uh, number over uh, CuPy. In which situations would you pick a number over CuPy or vice versa? Or can they be used together? Uh, so, um, that you can use them together, so um, number does recognize uh, CuPy arrays. Um, probably if you've got lots of um, NumPy uh, functions and routines in your code, CuPy is a nice and quick and easy way to just get it to run on the GPU. Um, if your code is more, um, is pure Python and you just want to add a decorator to to certain functions and speed up little bits, then number can be a useful tool there. And also with uh, number, you can use it on the CPU as well as the GPU. So if your code was something that you may not be running um, just on the GPU, then number would be your uh, better choice there. And we'll get one more question that was shuffling around all the time, and it's now first. Uh, so for the third example, your GPU is four times faster than CPU. Uh, was it also four times more expensive? Yeah, um, 
So. Yeah. If someone wants to clarify mm -hmm. what expensive means, the one that does little. Yes. I mean, I might have a camera, I might have a Ferrari, it's a lot quicker, but it's more expensive. So it's just a better cost of that. Okay, so in terms of, you know, get... I don't know how much GP costs. Yeah, I don't know how much they cost, but we, we have these GPUs available to us to use, and a lot of places are starting to get um, GPUs to use for a lot of their machine learning work and things like that, so having the potential to be able to use it for more of the general purpose um, processing as well um, can make use of GPUs when they're not being used for other things, so I guess in that way you, you're still saving. <laughs> So let's thank uh, Nicola uh, again.